Hello, everyone, and good evening. My name is Taryn Urquhart, and I'm the Arts and Special Events Programmer here at the West Vancouver Memorial Library. On behalf of the Library and the West Vancouver Art Museum, I would like to welcome you to tonight's architecture talk, Paul Merrick in conversation with Hilary Letwin. While I recognize that we were all in different places this evening, I would like to acknowledge that the West Vancouver Library and Art Museum reside within the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish Nation, Tsleil-Waututh Nation, and Musqueam Nation. We recognize and respect them as nations in this territory, as well as their historic connection to the lands and waters around us since time immemorial. I am personally grateful to call the Pacific Northwest my home, and I'm thankful to the Coast Salish communities that continue to protect the natural beauty and animal diversity that surround me every day. It has been my great pleasure to work with Hilary Letwin and her guest tonight to, to, bring, to bring this event to our community. So now I would like to pass things over to Hilary, who is waiting for us over at the museum. Hilary. Thank you, Taryn, and thank you to the West Vancouver Memorial Library for hosting our talk this evening. Paul, it's such a pleasure to see you. You're located in Victoria, uh, and I'm here at the West Vancouver Art Museum in your exhibition, the current exhibition, A Twist of the Rules, The Architecture of Paul Merrick, which is on here at the Art Museum until June 23rd. Uh, Paul, I'd like to start out our talk this evening by speaking a little bit about your connection to West Vancouver. Can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing in West Vancouver and perhaps also speak about the connection that you have to the West Vancouver Art Museum's home, Gertrude Lawson House? Well, it's it, uh, on reflection, it's, it's quite a pleasant story. I had the great good fortune to be born in West Vancouver. Uh, technically, I suppose it was North Vancouver because West Van hasn't, hasn't a hospital. And I, and I find uh, a, a bit of minor amusement in, in the fact that the, the building I was born in, in North Vancouver Hospital, is still there. It's now a psychiatric ward, which uh, is, is, uh, <clears throat> some people find amusing. Um, we, we lived on Sentinel Hill in the Ambleside. Uh, we had, the family was in West Van because grandfather was an engineer on the West Van Ferries from the early 20s. And uh, so I grew up in a, a very, I, I think on hindsight, I realized a, a really uh, wonderful, close-knit, uh, easygoing village. It was a very strong community. And uh, most people knew most other people. We all knew the bus drivers and we knew the shopkeepers. And, and a few of them are even still there. And Amble, Ambleside was our shopping precinct. Uh, and uh, we, at the time, um, uh, we lived on Dutchess uh, uh, 1000 block, which at the time didn't go through. So at the end of the street was just wilderness, it was woodlands. And uh, as youngsters, uh, we, we built a lot of time in that woodland and, and building forts and, and things like that. A couple of amusing stories around that that I won't go into. Um, and uh, the, the, um, the, the went through uh, uh, fir first elementary school at Hollyburn, which amazingly is still there, still the same building, still intact. Uh, the high school, of course, was what then became the Y and has now been replaced with the new building, but uh, uh, that, 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 was, that was Ambleside. Um, the, the, um, I think part of the impact of, of, of that in, in, in terms of how, how I was able to see the world as, as it went on was, was that uh, as, as a community, it, it, uh, I felt quite grounded and, and in, in a good place and supported by the, the, the local society that one was a part of. And so I found along with the a, a two or three early influences I had, which we've talked about before, um, uh, found that uh, uh, it was it was not difficult to grow up having at least a reasonable sense of oneself that you could you could explore things and and uh, at an early stage was kind of I don't know not so much taught but given permission to ask why 
So, Paul, I'd love to hear your connection to Gertrude Lawson House. I think there was somebody who was an early influence in your life uh, who had a connection to the building. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. Uh, having grown up in Ambleside and gone to Hollyburn School, as I said, I found myself uh, in, I think it was the second grade, with a teacher named Gertrude Lawson. And I had learned uh, over the time uh, that uh, her father, John Lawson, was one of, if not one of the original settlers in West Vancouver and, and his, Lawson Park at the foot of 17th now is, of course, in his name. And that's, that's where his farm was. And his farm extended up the hill to, in, in fact, uh, apparently include lands that the city hall across the road from where you are uh, in the museum, um, which was Gertrude Lawson's home. Uh, with that, that, that land was given to the municipality by John Lawson. Uh, Gertrude Lawson uh, was uh, just my grade one teacher. Uh, she never married. Uh, I, I, I'm told generally that it was her father who built this stone house for her. And, uh, and she took in, uh, among other things, uh, tenants, uh, typically uh, single, single people. And, and I've, I've learned recently that they were, they were typically women who were uh, on their own and, and making their own way. And one of those women, uh, tenants of Gertrude's became my stepmother. Uh, she, she was my natural mother's uh, friend uh, in, in their early teens. Uh, they knew each other. And so she was a friend of the family all my growing years. My mother sadly died when I was about seven. And so sometime after that, this, this lady, Betty Copeland, or Elizabeth Copeland, um, became my, my stepmother. Uh, she had been the public health nurse and the school nurse in West Van, and so a lot of people knew her. Uh, as a young person in the 40s, um, uh, she had a car, which very few people did, which was kind of a privilege, we, we realized latterly. But she proved, among other things, to be a wonderful person in terms of uh, both provoking me and, and stewarding me and, and, and uh, I guess, providing a... a a reason to have confidence in, in exploring one's path. And I, I think you you had noted uh, previously that she handed you a copy of Frank Lloyd Wright's autobiography when you were 17. Yes. And it sounded like that was something that sort of set you on the course to architecture. <laughs> Among other things, I'm sure it was very influential. Uh, because that autobiography, which even I find a lot of my colleagues aren't familiar with because so much has been published about Wright and his work. Uh, and most of it is full of extraordinary photographs because his work is so photograph not photographic, I guess, uh, photogenic. Uh, there's, not a, there's not a shot of anything in that. It's just verbiage. Uh, and it's his story of his life. Uh, at, I guess and he was in his late 60s, early 70s at the time he wrote this. And of course, he lived another decade or two. And, and the, the thing about, um, about his, his story was uh, he, he uh, kind of illustrated from an early age how he acquired his view of things and his value structure and what he found to be important. Of course, he grew up in Wisconsin and they were farm people and it was much more rural than we're used to. And... Uh, uh, but but he and, and he and he had the, the these uh, 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 wooden blocks as a child that his mother had given him to to uh, explore form and composition and but three dimensionally with uh, and and he 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 went variously into the influences of his aunts and relatives and and. Uh, they're at a, they, I don't know that they were Quakers, but they 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 were they they had a quite a simplistic, you know, shaker-like view of, of life and, and, and how to care for each other. And uh, so, so he, I, I think in a, in a word, uh, one of, one of, the, one of the, the best summaries of what that man was about uh, came from Mrs. Cheney, who was, was an uh, early client of his in Oak Park in Chicago and, and uh, went on to become uh, his, I guess second wife, and when when uh, Mrs. Cheney with her first husband were looking for an architect, they they sought uh, many out and and decided that Mr. Wright was the only one who uh, evidenced a, a continence of principle, 
And uh, I thought I thought that uh, pretty pretty well summed, summed it up. So, I mean, because we're presenting this talk tonight with the library, it's very appropriate that a, a book should be credited with setting you on your course <laughs> towards architecture. Uh, and I do, I love that connection to Gertrude Lawson House and your stepmother being a boarder here. Um, Paul, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of your projects here in West Vancouver and also uh, outside of West Vancouver. Um, I'm of course sitting in front of the wall devoted to the Orpheum Theater project in Vancouver. This was a renovation project that you undertook in the early 80s. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about um, your work on the Orpheum Theater and how this project came about. Can you tell us about that? Excuse me. Um, I probably have, have to begin with a story consistent with, with uh, where we are. My first experience at, in that Orpheum Theatre was uh, as, as fairly, fairly early in my youth. I might have been 10 or 11 or 12. Uh, and, and this new mother of ours, um, Miss Copeland, uh, took my brother and I to a concert in the afternoon. It would, would have been a Sunday afternoon concert, I think. And I, I don't remember what was playing or, or much about the music. Uh, except that it was uh, uh, a, a magical experience. Uh, but, but I remember uh, at intermission, uh, we, we were in the balcony, of course, in the lower class seats and went out on the balcony on Seymour Street, that's still there, uh, and looked, looked down on the street. And there were all the Cadillacs and LaSalle's and, and the like from the folks who we presume lived in Shaughnessy, uh, waiting for their, uh, the, uh, his lordship to to come out and be driven home. And they were all having a cigarette and chatting with each other. And that, that was my perception of the good life <laughs> when, it, when it came to, to, to fine music. Many years later, of course, uh, the orphan was uh, uh, at that point, uh, uh, a movie house owned by famous players been built as a vaudeville house. It was, it was designed by Marcus Pritica. Uh, I had practiced, I think, at that point out of Seattle. And he apparently had, it was the 749th theater he had built across North America. He, he was uh, of, a, of a good age by then. And so he had, uh, he had learned more or less empirically what made a good house, what made good sound. And at that time, of course, at the turn of the last century, amplifications and systems and the like were. Uh, certainly not developed the way we know them today. So, so you you had to uh, manage the projection and 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 the and the, and the, and the quality of, of sound, even as a vaudeville house. As most people know, that, that there's there's still an organ in there, which the, what the words are, which was part of the, the original format of presentation. Uh, the the famous players was wanting to sell the building uh, as they already had sold the Capitol Theater next door. And uh, there was a group in Vancouver uh, called the Community Arts uh, Council, I think, something like that. And a, and a then partner in my early years at Thompson Burke Pratt, uh, John Deaton had been a member of the Community Arts Council and learned about this. And so a number of them uh, created a case that they put to city council to, to take on the uh, the building uh, because uh, by that time, of course, the Queen Elizabeth had, had been operating for some time. And, and they found that uh, it, it was, of course, multi-purpose, was still is a multi-purpose hall. It had a very big stage and huge striking areas. It was good for, for ballet and opera and, and large scale stage presentations. But it didn't have that brilliant a sound uh, quality uh, for, for concert. Uh, orchestra work, uh, so that so they thought that uh, the orchestra would would be a wonderful alternative and, a, and 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 in fact highly inexpensive way of getting a concert hall in the city. So the city was convinced to take it on with the help of the, the federal government was willing to come aboard equal share. Uh, I think on the grounds that the foyers would be expanded because. Uh, along with all of it, as, as, as we know, it sits behind the lane on, C on C between uh, Lane and Seymour, and there's just wonderful gallery access from from uh, Orpheum Street, which is traditionally its main entrance. 
but but the the lobbies were although they're wonderful spaces they're tight and congested um, for the size of house it is which is over three thousand uh, twenty eight hundred seats I think um, so it became a case of expanding the foyers. Uh, uh, which was done as a second stage and, and more importantly, expanding the performance area, the stage. And uh, there, there, there were very limited ways of doing that because the back wall of the stage was hard against the adjacent property. You couldn't expand uh, away from the, from the house proper. Uh, so it was a case of either going, expanding it sideways or forwards into the house. And we did that as much as was practical, but the problem with that is that as you come forwards towards the patron already established in the seating, you start to lose sight line from the balcony, especially uh, of, of, you know, the most important person on the stage being the conductor probably, uh, or, the, or the soloist. And, and uh, so, so even to this day, you'll see the stage still goes further forward than they typically will arrange the orchestra. And that's because of the sight lines. Unless, unless it's a very large uh, you know, orchestra and choir combination. Um, going sideways was, was accomplished by literally taking the entire uh, um, uh, finished development, the, 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 uh, the kind of entablatures I side of the stage and the stage uh, arch, the proscenium, uh, which is all done in suspended plaster work. Uh, in fact, the, the whole of the house surfaces are just plaster suspended from a structural shell uh, and, and took it apart and, and kind of recreated it literally as, yeah. as Critica had designed it, but half again as big. Yeah. And uh, most people don't, don't realize that because uh, it's, it's essentially the same vocabulary that was there originally. But the, the proscenium was pushed up into the, into the cornice and the, and the transects were, were, were widened to accommodate a bigger performing area. Tony Heisberg, and as I said, was the decorator and he uh, uh, he was a wonderful, he, he was in, well, a, a cute story about his age uh, uh, at a reception. He was, he was a, a, a Dutch fellow, had been a decorator all his life and he had been the original decorator of the Orpheum, which is why uh, we were able to dig him up through Marcus Pritik as successor in Seattle. And uh, he's, he was then living in Los Angeles and he had a home in Karnak in France where he'd go every summer with a roll of canvases and he'd come home with a roll of paintings. And, and he was the most amazing Bozardian copyist. Uh, he, could, he could paint in, uh, he took me to a, to, to a, a health club, like a Y facility in downtown Los Angeles that had this beautiful um, uh, pool so they, they, they were developed like Roman tepidarium, uh, 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 the, the, the Roman baths of, of the classical time. And, and he'd done it all in paint. He didn't look at the tile closely. There were one inch square tiles and that was all painted by Tony. <laughs> and and uh, he, he developed, uh, when, when we came to have him recreate uh, the theater, he, he developed a, uh, uh, two or three different options, which I learned was how, how you did it in the Bozardian, Bozardian school of thought. Uh, there was the elephant scheme and the gold and silver scheme and the, you know, the, 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 the gray and gold scheme. And you would, you would pick one and that then became the, 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 the drawing from which the, uh, the painters doing the restoration worked. And, and then the last story about Tony was he wanted to do uh, a mural in the dome, which which was there, but it ne never been finished, and it, it, it was full of uh, when we took it on for 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 the musical, uh, the uh, sorry, the film use, um, the cinema use. Uh, it had been filled with absorbent material um, because there were some bad reflections uh, because domes do that, uh, and and so Tony wanted to do a mural. Uh, it, that was agreed, and there was some ways developed of funding it. Uh, mm -hmm. So he worked himself in his, his, his wife, he called Little Tiger. If you look at the ceiling, you'll find a tiger there. That's Tony Einsbergen's wife. And he wanted to put all my children in, so he had us take photographs uh, of them. They were all four, five, six, seven. And uh, uh, they, they, they were all... Uh, uh, 
uh, unclothed little uh, nymphs, uh, except uh, uh, the youngest, who, who is Maya, uh, who is actually out here from Montreal today. And, and uh, he said, well, she was too young to, and too innocent to, to not be without clothes. So he put her in an ID. But that, that's all, all the little kids up there. And the, the conductor, I think, is, is, uh, was my partner, Ron Nelson, at the time. Now deceased, who, who was the kind of manager of the project in the first behalf. So the faces of your children are immortalized on the on the roof of the on the ceiling of the Orpheum Theater. I so Paul, the the Orpheum Theater is a great example of a heritage building that you took on and and sort of oversaw the renovation for and and we see this happening throughout your career. Um, I'm thinking of the Marine Building, for example. I'm thinking of the new customs house project that you've more or less just completed in Victoria. There are these heritage buildings that you um, have come in and, and sort of given new life to. Um, but I'd like to contrast that with some of your totally new projects. And I'm thinking about the, um, the um, Cathedral Place project in Vancouver, uh, of course, across from the um, from the Hotel Vancouver and the Vancouver Art Gallery. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that project and and maybe talk a bit about how um, these new projects are separate from your heritage projects? That, that that's a good question that has also multiple levels of, of, of depth. This this thing we call heritage. Uh, is, is kind of ubiquitous term even because it tends to imply the acknowledgement of some kind of lineage or age or it, it, it's old and so things have to be old in order to be heritage. And, and the reality is, of course, everything we, we do and build and inhabit is, is our heritage, whether it was built last week or last century. And uh, uh, but, but we've evolved ways of, of trying to come to grips with how to distinguish or articulate what, what that might mean. And it's, it's not enough for something simply to be old, but it needs to be, uh, in, in whatever its age, it needs to be worth respect and, and, and looking after. Um, along with that, uh, uh, from another point of view, I've always, I've always had the view that, that the, the, the world we inhabit, our, our environment made up of buildings, uh, is, is a kind of organism. It's, uh, uh, if, if you do zoom back, which I'm always in danger of doing, uh, it's as if each project is a cell in the organism of the city or the village or the community or, or, or the nation for that matter. And uh, uh, collectively, the... Uh, in the, the environment we have it is as good as each and every individual cell that we add to it that makes it up. And, and uh, whether a project is a new project on a clean site or an added to an altered project as the customs house you mentioned, for instance, uh, was part, part of it vintage and part of its current, um, or, or, or whether it's just a, a, an old building that needs new life breathed break, in the, as the Orpheum has. Um, I, I, I've come to find those, I guess I've had the good fortune of being offered a number of those kinds of projects and realize over time that they really are quite meaningful because they're, they're not just about, um, you know, bigger and better or, or replacing old with new. Uh, because we've been through a part even, even in our lifetimes where that, that was thought to be the way to do things. And it didn't take us long to realize that that wasn't necessarily the best. It was often better to try and, and, and uh, repair and add new life to uh, vintage stock. Uh, I've long thought a, a, a building properly made, uh, even, even in very simple materials, um, will endure far longer, far longer than any one of us as, as human. We have a lifespan maybe of a century, um, uh, if we're fortunate. And thank goodness it doesn't necessarily go on longer than that. Um, but, uh, but buildings will last many centuries, uh, even made of simple material, um, if they're looked after. 
and 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 they need to be. I, I remember a, a, a moment in years years back in in uh, visiting Salzburg uh, near where where my wife's uh, 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 family uh, were from, and and went of course to see Wolfgang's house, um, and it, which is uh, uh, you know a an embellished facade on a main street where all the buildings are cheek by jowl, party wall buildings as they were at, at, in that time. And with a small courtyard in the, you know, an H shape or a, a, an a I shape or an E shape, they, they, the way pre 20th century buildings were, were built. And in that case, you came in kind of from the back into this courtyard and went up the stair to visit uh, Wolfie, as we refer to Mr. Mozart. And, and there was a little sign there saying that when Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart lived in this building, uh, it was already 200 years old. And so that man so, so, so he said, well, uh, that makes it about 400 and somewhat now. And that was already a few decades ago. And, and, it, and it was perfectly sound and intact. And it, and it, and it, and it was built literally of uh, uh, mostly brick and rubble. The side walls were all just whatever they could scrounge. Uh, the facade was always better material that maybe stone or, or fired, fired uh, material. And the wood was hard to come by, so they used it sparingly. The, the, the rafters and beams and, 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 and the like were just poles cut from trees that, that uh, they would have been able to manage them. And, and, and yet it was four or 500 years old. Um, and, and completely usable and, and, and as were all its neighbors still there. And uh, uh, it, it uh, has, has, has left me feeling over time that breathing new life into an existing building fabric is, is really almost a quiet kind of honor to, 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 uh, to, uh, nurture uh, or maintain or sustain the, the life of something that's, that, uh, that's already done some, a good deal of duty. It's already had a life and is capable of more. And, and it leads to the, something we call adaptive reuse where uh, an old building fabric may be put to a very different use from, from what I am in a simple example. Again, the, or the orphan was built as a water rail house, which is quite a different, different although it's a, a, a place of assembly, the needs of Otterville quite different than, say, a concert hall, uh, which is which is mutated into. Uh, in St. Anne's in Victoria, it, it was a, a a school built by the sisters in, uh, of St. Anne's, and and is now uh, a government office building. It may not always be a government office building, but the, the, the happy the happy note is that it's 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 now uh, where where three or four decades ago when we restored it. it it uh, probably had a lifespan of another century or so, and it's now got a lifespan of another several. Again, if it's looked after, it looked much the same from the outside. A new building was built inside and tied up, tied back. And, and uh, the, the, the issue that comes out of, 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 of these kinds of journeys um, always have to do with the degree to which you alter or intervene in the degree to which you maintain and retain and respect. Absolutely. One of my early uh, heritage advisors, consultants, uh, was, was Harold Collin, who um, had, as he was really the kind of father of, of heritage thinking in, in the West Coast. He, he had operated then out of Ottawa uh, and had come from, from the US. But he had a lovely term for, for being too precious about uh, Retaining heritage, he, he called it. It, it was. You could either refer to it as mummification or petrification, both of which imply <laughs> <laughs> that, that not much presence of life. And and uh, I had at that point again the good fortune of having spent a couple of years living in Britain, doing a project in the Middle East, and and found a world that was roughly 10 times old, as old as, as the world we, we're familiar with, the, the West Coast colony of, of, you know, at an age of about a century, and where, where Britain had an age of roughly 10 centuries from, from even more primitive times. 
and uh, they they had some time, you know, with the advent of the industrial revolution and all that went with it, and the um, uh, um, escalation of population and and, and 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 the rest. They had had to start to learn about these things uh, that we were just beginning to be confronted with half a century ago, which the Orpheum was an example of. Yeah, no, it's a, it, I'm sorry. Uh, it's an excellent example. I, Paul, before we wrap up, I would really like to speak uh, to um, some more local projects here in West Vancouver. Uh, and the first project I'd like to just touch on is the renovation to the West Vancouver Memorial Library, our host this evening. Uh, you were brought in to do that renovation. And I think that um, uh, there were some changes to the plan. Can you speak very briefly about that project? Absolutely. And it's a perfect example of what we're just talking about, of this metamorphosis and, and uh, the life that a building had. The original building was built as a Second World War Memorial, they call it Memorial Library, done by Bob Berwick uh, at Trotsenberg. And, and uh, in, in the, 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 the uh, uh, post and beam or timber frame structure with a scissor truss across the main space. And that that, that was a good, but had become too small uh, for, for its purpose. Uh, it sat roughly in the middle of its site, which went from 19th to, to east to the creek. And so we were able to add on to it around its edges, uh, going west uh, to expand the, uh, the, the, the stacked areas and put some parking on top of that because of the grade made that possible and then on the east end put the children's center and went down to the creek and into the trees and the like. Um, uh, but, but it's a good example of how something relatively small and simple if, if there's room can be can be added and modified and, and still have a coherence. A couple of cute stories uh, which your librarian friend will, will probably be amused by. Um, uh, the, the, uh, at the time of doing the first renovations, uh, because the, 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 li the library is situated where if, you, if you're not driving there, you're, you're walking east or west on Green Drive on the sidewalk. And so you're coming at it from either end. So we put an entrance uh, uh, at either end of the original um, um, Memorial Library. And, and on the east end, built a walkway out to to the street and on the east end, it was at the bottom, bottom of the stairs coming from the parking. And there was much debate about that. Um, I think the, the librarian's name at the time was Elizabeth Muster, as I recall, or something, something close to that. Uh, she was a wonderful person, but she was very concerned about control. And of course, in, in those days, we didn't have the kind of electronic devices for book control and, and, and the like that, that, that we have today. So it, it was a case of, being, being able to stay on top of what books you had in house and which were being taken out and whether they'd been returned or not and, and all the like. So, so we, we argued much about this, but, but uh, or debated, I suppose, and, and, uh, and, and, and built both, both, both those points of access. But it wasn't a matter of months, I don't think, and I lived out west at the time and would drive by it every day. And one day I came, was coming in, uh, and, and there was a man up on the roof of the of the, new, uh, the second entrance with a chainsaw cutting it up into sections that became bus stops down Marine Drive all the way to where she went. <laughs> so uh, much as you may persist in, in having your way over something, which I don't remember being, being that ardent about, uh, the, the world has a way of getting it the way it needs it to be for, for its own purpose. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, yeah. Paul, I'd, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. It's such a pleasure to connect and to hear about some of these different projects. Uh, and I would like to encourage our, our participants this evening to join us at our exhibition here at the West Vancouver Art Museum. The Orpheum Theatre is one of the projects that we covered. And you can see Paul's beautiful sketch behind me. Um, Paul, you are a, a fantastic architect, but you are also an incredible draftsman. And we have some really lovely examples of your sketches in our exhibition. Uh, so I'd like to close out and, and thank you, Paul, for joining us this evening uh, and encourage our participants to come and see us at the Art Museum soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hilary.